scripture, isn't it? I think so anyway. I didn't hear much feedback there. Um, we want to talk a bit about vision, but before we do, we had a quite a, quite a busy week. We had Scott Wilson, uh, who reminded us what an incredible resource he is in the, in the things that he brings and the things that he shares and the impact he makes on so many lives. And certainly on Terry and I, we spend uh, 24 hours with Scott. Um, he goes through things in detail. He's certainly not afraid to call things out. And we find that really helpful. Then we had uh, three days prayer and fasting, Accelerate we call it, and we had a prayer meeting Friday night. Uh, so I'm expecting breakthrough and I trust that you will expect breakthrough. We're trusting that God is going to move as a result of the time we've spent seeking him and praying. So let's talk about vision because I think every year at least once we should think about it because we're all breathing. Are you breathing? You're fairly confident you're breathing? That means that you're alive. That means that you've, you've got to do something with your life. So where are you going? What are you heading towards? What's the vision that continually constrains and directs and excites and sends you on adventures? You know, Terry and I believe that God wants um, Hope Church to be a community of people who are strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, who bring influence and transformation to our families, friends, neighbors, and communities that we represent and, and our nation as well. That, and what does it mean to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might? Well, it means people who know God who are, and they know that God loves them and they are empowered by the, the power of his spirit to live life well and to live life successfully. People who grow in confidence, people who grow in faith, people who grow with hope, who have an ability to love and care beyond what they might have otherwise had, an ability to sustain long-term relationships and build great relationships that's the kind of thing about being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. People who can conquer their challenges and even uh, overcome impossibilities that are in the natural beyond us personally, but in Jesus' name are possible. And so we want to see a people who are full of peace and joy and hope and love and, and the righteousness in the Holy Spirit of God. And so we want you to be strong in the spirit and in the power of God's love and his might, and to be all that God intended you to be. You and I, all of us, we have a unique opportunity to fulfill God-given dreams and visions for your life, both individually and together with our church family. And so this is a bit, it's a bit different from a normal Sunday message, and I hope you can bear with me, and I hope you get something for yourself. But we believe it's important to have some kind of vision. And we know that God works as in community and, and we believe our lives work best in family and community. So uh, it's actually how he, he designed us. And he designed us to pursue vision, to, to have some direction. Who here has ever spent a year where you never thought about going on a holiday? You never thought about buying something different or new. You never thought about how to improve your home or any, you know, you understand what I mean? Like the way we live, we're always dealing with vision and the thing that excites us is vision. If you don't believe me, I was watching Connor and Nikki skip out of here on Friday night because they're on their way to Turkey for a holiday. Their vision was we're going to have our, finally have our kind of honeymoon holiday thing and believe me, they were not trudging out of here with their eyes downcast. Do you know what I mean? The vision of let's go on a holiday, let's fly overseas. Nikki's never been on a plane before. So we're all trying to give her lessons about how, you know, you've got to be careful. Your arms will fall off if you don't hold them right. And, you know, all sorts of important lessons. <laughs> um, but vision excites us and inspires us. And so I want to talk about it. And in Proverbs 29, 18 in the Bible, it, it gives some really good ideas. And one of them is this, where there's no revelation or where there's no unfolding vision, where there's no sense of God leading you to, towards something, people cast off restraint. They lose self-discipline. They just give up. They just kind of, anything goes. But happy is he who keeps the law. Happy is the person who goes with him. Without an unfolding sense of what God wants for us, we lose our way and we're prone to temptations that appeal to our flesh, but take us away from the path of following Jesus as accurately as we are able or could or should. 
That always leads to negative consequences. Always. So what is God, the God-given vision for your life? What is it that God has purposed you for? What are the things? How are you going towards it? Are you walking by God's vision for your life or are you walking by the one that appeals to your flesh? That's a good question, isn't it? I've listened to lots of uh, followers of Jesus talking about their vision for life and I've realised that God had nothing to do with it. They're just passionate about their stuff. This is my dreams and my ideas and God had better fit in to my plans. Like, oh, you're over God now. You're bigger than God. That's very clever. It's impressive. So, do you have, uh, you have an idea of what, how, why God got you on this planet? Maybe this week you can decide to get this sorted out if you haven't already. In Habakkuk 2.2, 2, or Habakkuk, or I don't know how people pronounce this one differently, don't they? It's great trying to spell it too. In the Old Testament, one of the minor prophets, Habakkuk 2, verses 2 and 3, it says, Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. So vision is about the future. But at the end it will speak. It will not lie. Because you always find out. If you say, well, by the end of next year, I'm going to see Disneyland Europe. Well, by the end of next year, you know whether you've made it or not. Does that make sense? It will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Like, don't give up on visions. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry if it's a vision from God. One of the great principles of living life well is to live with vision. To have it clearly written as a tool that you can use every day. In situations like your daily time alone with God, where you can look at the vision and say... This is what God wants me to do. This is the overarching vision for my life. And this is the things that I'm looking to achieve this year. And that might include Disneyland or something, you know, whatever it might be. But to have them written down. That's what the Bible says anyway. So do you have a vision that God has got for your life written down clearly? Are you heading somewhere in life? Or are you wandering aimlessly in a wilderness? Because that's the kind of, you know, areas that we can be wandering aimlessly in a wilderness or we can, you know, all the way through to we can be just full of clarity, charging at breakneck speed, like Duhan van der Merwe when he took off the last part of the game yesterday. Um, it's a famous Scottish name, Duhan van der Merwe. He's the Scottish winger, for those who don't know anything. He plays rugby union in Scotland. He, he helped Scotland win well. Anyway, you know, you, you can run towards a vision, straining everything in you like he was. Where are you on the scale? What have you got written down? When was the last time you looked at the reason you're alive, the vision, the 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 purposes, the ideas of what my life is going to count for. What will be my legacy? We were ribbing another pastor about that recently. Well, I wasn't. I was listening to some other pastors rib a pastor about that. Maybe that's something you can decide to act upon this week, to write your vision, make it plain. And, and understand this, God is into community. He's not terribly excited about individualistic, self-centered approaches to life which exclude, exclude a team approach. God, here listen to this, is three persons in such perfect harmony that he is one. So we know, we, we can't understand it, but how are you going to ever understand God? I mean, imagine for a moment who God is. He intimately knows every single language on the planet that's impressive, but not just that. He, he individually knows every single person on the planet and has 100% focus on every single person on the planet and he knows more about you do than you ever will. He knows what's going on in your body, your soul and your spirit. He's, he's, he's got it. And so... How do we understand God? Well, I'll tell you, he is beyond our comprehension 
And so there's issues about who he is that we just have to go with. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three persons in perfect harmony so that he is one. But that's the perfect community. It's no surprise that God wants us to live in community. And church family is one of the things. You know, Scott Wilson was saying there's three things that God loves. And successful life is to line up with those. He loves the world, so he wants to reach people who are lost. He loves the church. You know, I've had it too. I've had people go, oh, look, Jesus is all right, but I don't like the church. And I go, well, you're up the creek with Jesus then. And there is no paddle for sure in that place. He loves the church. And the third thing is he loves a cheerful giver. Isn't this interesting? Hello? So he loves the world. That's his mission field for he loves the church, which is the people he needs to reach his mission field. And how are they going to do it? Well, if they've got cheerful givers, they can fund the activities to do what they're here for. Has anybody ever thought that way before? I thought it was exciting to listen to. So what is God saying to our church? Because if you're here, if you're part of church, then you have a role to play. You have something to do. You have contributions. You, you actually have great value. And what is God saying to our church? And the scripture that seems to sum up a lot of his current ideas is Zechariah 4.6. Um, we've had it a couple of years now. And I think that there's, there's something happening in, in our church. And God wants to do something in our lives by his Holy Spirit. He wants us to understand more about the power of his Spirit. He wants us to be more intimately acquainted with the person of the Holy Spirit. And it says in Zechariah 4, 6, So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. You know, we recognize that many of our hopes and dreams for our families, our, our lives, our friends, our communities require the unleashing of the power of the Holy Spirit. There are many things that you have in your heart that you pray for that you know will not come about unless God is involved. They're beyond you. They're impossible or they're unreachable or they're unattainable for various logical, natural reasons. But in Jesus' name, anything's possible. And we want to walk in the power of that, don't you? Like I think about people who don't want to follow Jesus and I think you want to live within the limitations of your best efforts. You want to live within the limitations of all the things that are impossible to you. You want to live within the limitations of your weaknesses and your failings. I want to live with the unlimited power of God helping me to live beyond what I could otherwise live, do what I could otherwise achieve and see what God can do with a piece of you know, so I often think of myself not in the most, the best of terms. What God can do with me. I'm constantly amazed. You know, when I first started in faith, I've heard, I've had people, you know, you've heard this before. I was the guy that the pastors told to give up. You'll never achieve anything and you'll never be in ministry. And you can't preach. And you, you, you will never preach. And I just went, well, we'll see what God can do. Hello? Because I felt like God wanted me to be a preacher. And this is when I knew I couldn't even stand up in front of people. I know that 96% of people think that uh, st public speaking is, is more fearful to them than death itself. But um, I was at the extreme end of I, I couldn't even speak in public. I was just a bumbling, stumbling idiot who believed that God had given me a vision to be a preacher. Hello? So a vision in Jesus' name, with the power of the Holy Spirit, God can take your life so much further, you can live so much more, you can have so much more satisfaction and joy and peace and, and, and adventure. Hallelujah. Adventure. You know, I've preached in mega churches, I've preached in Thailand, I've preached in Sri Lanka, I've preached in all kinds of places, in all sorts of strange situations. 
I've preached in front of men who had come to kill me and I've seen God break their hearts and, and lead them to himself. It's amazing what you do when you walk with God. I want to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and I'm trying to inspire and encourage you to get a hold of this scripture for yourself. I'm not just going to live by my efforts, by my best, by my mind power, my will power. I'm going to live in the unparalleled, matchless, majestic power of an almighty God. I want to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Hello? Is anybody getting anything here or you all half asleep? You know, this scripture is a word and I, I want to encourage you to take a hold of it and to make it a personal thing for yourself. And, and decide, I'm going to make personal adjustments here. I don't want to live within just my limitations. There's more to life than this. I'm basically living in the more to, the, more to life than this. Hello? And it make, God makes it clear that you know, he can use his Holy Spirit to do something in us that is beyond our power, our might, our limitations, our weaknesses, our faults, our failings. God wants to do something. He wants adventure. He wants joy. See, God is the source of life. He is the author of life. Have you ever been around somebody who's really full of life? Have you ever been around one of those bubbly people just full of life? And they just inspire you and they encourage you and you like, you feel like you could go and take on the devil or, you know, leap tall buildings in a single bound or something because they get that bubble. Well, God is way beyond that. He is absolutely full of life. He is bubbling with life. Absolutely dynamically full of life. And you connect to that and you'll start to live life like you've never lived it. Hallelujah. So let's get a hold of God. And so the first thing, a vision thing for us, is to have a hunger for the presence, a hunger for the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, something in us that reaches out, compels us to go after him, that says, all right, Lord, I'm living, I'm going to live without the boundaries and, and restrictions of what I am, and I'm going to see what you can do as we step out together in Jesus' name. Does that sound good? Where's Josh? More of an adventure, Josh, than sitting watching a screen all day, isn't it? I feel sorry for the young people of today. You know, uh, I remember my father saying, oh, I don't like this world much, you know, the, I'm, I'm, I've got too old, I'm out of here. I'm starting to think a bit the same. I mean, I feel sorry for the young people growing up and the challenges that they're facing and the difficulties and things. But what I am reminded of is that the same was said of my generation and we got a hold of the power of God and we saw what God could do and it was quite amazing what God could do. And so it's the same for every generation. We can get a hold of God and see it and get a hunger for him, a hunger for the presence of God. And I want, you know, where are you going to find the Holy Spirit? Do you know how to find the Holy Spirit? Do you know where he is right now? I mean, how do you find, if you're going to hunger for the Holy Spirit, where is he? Has anybody seen him? No. We don't usually, he's like the wind. You can see the effects of his presence, but you don't necessarily see him. So where is he, I wonder? Have you ever thought that? Where, how, if I'm going to pursue God, if I'm going to pursue the Holy Spirit, if that's the vision that God wants for us as a church and therefore me as an individual, where do I find him? Well, if you're born again, the answer is obvious. He's already inside you. But wait, there's more. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When you say yes to Jesus, he implants his DNA into you. The Holy Spirit comes into you. You have God's DNA. And then we spend the rest of our life leaving the things that we're familiar with of the world and the flesh and the devil and, and our experience and our upbringing and everything and taking on more and more of what's already inside us. Hello? It's quite amazing that when you start to look for the Holy Spirit, it's too late. He's already with you. You don't have to go searching here and there and climb a mountain and, and uh, you know, do all sorts of weird things. You just have to go, oh, thank goodness, I'm born again by the Spirit of God. That means he's already inside me. 
and all of his nature is inside of me. I'm a new creation. When? When I was born again, I became a new creation. Did I feel like it? Not necessarily. Did I act like it? Well, in some ways. I remember friends commenting to me. I said to one guy, I was gathering the courage to tell him that I'd become a follower of Jesus, a friend of mine. And I said, I've got something to tell you. He said, you've gone and given your life to Jesus, haven't you? I was like, how do you know? He said, well, I'm, you're not doing this and this. And in, the, in, in three minutes in the car, I can already tell. And I didn't, I didn't even realize that God had transformed me, that things had changed. I used to have the foulest mouth known to man. And Australians swear way more than Scots, believe me. Like, uh, Scots don't have a clue about swearing in comparison to Aussies. Aussies are so foul-mouthed, it's disgusting. Well, I made the Aussies quail. And I didn't even notice, but I stopped swearing the moment I got born again. And I didn't even think about it. I didn't try it because of the transforming power of God, the Holy Spirit, the new creation, the new nature. You've got that. He's inside you. He's already planted his DNA. He's already planted his nature. You have the new nature of God's kingdom if you're born again inside you. Now your journey is to get that out, unleash that, to see the reality of that, to unleash the potential of what's already been placed inside you. Is that making sense? So let's get hungry for the presence of God. Let's get hungry for his presence. Transformation is meant to be a theme of our lives anyway. Romans 12.2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'm going by, my notes have disappeared, so I'm going by memory. Hopefully I said that scripture right. If you're born again, you're a follower of God, then all you need to do now is take the time to say, All right, Lord, I want your new nature to be unleashed inside of me more than I've ever had it before. And I'm going to be hungry for you, hungry for your presence. You, we can, you and I can live by our natural, world-oriented, sin-affected understanding that we've had from the time we were born, or we can dare to believe God and dare to hunger after God to an extent where he will transform and minister and change and impact so many areas of our lives and build within us strengths that we never thought were possible. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, last Sunday I thought, am I catching the flu? And this week I've got it. And now I'm getting over the last, well, I'm sort of over the flu, but I'm, well, I'm well and truly over the flu. I'll be glad when this winter's over. You know, they're telling us that we're catching up on the last two because of lockdowns, as well as this one. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm sort of feeling that way. I mean, half the nation was sick leading up to Christmas and then January the same. So I'll be glad when this winter's over and we can say, good, we'll get back to a normal winter where you only catch one bug. <laughs> so our, what, what do you want for Christmas? Just one flu, please. <laughs> Not one after the other. Um, that was a joke. And, I'm not suggesting that, you know, I think hopefully you get that. Why does our church exist? Why do you exist? Why are you here on planet Earth? Shall I tell you? If you don't know. We exist to make disciples for Jesus and to be disciples of Jesus. So we become disciples of Jesus and then we disciple others. And it starts with us discipling people from outside the kingdom of God into the kingdom of God, into the local church. We're all designed to be disciple makers. We all have the heavenly DNA implanted within us. We actually have the capacity to do it. Every single one of us has God's DNA. We can do it. And I think part of the journey this year is that we should kind of find out how that works better for us. Because many people go, oh, it's a bit hard or a bit whatever. And there's the fear of man that gets in the way of, oh, I don't want to say things and... All kinds of stuff. But I think this year we're going to see what God can do. Does that sound good light, like a good idea to you? Let's hunger after the Holy Spirit and say, not my will, but thy will be done. Let's be desperate to see and experience the power of the Holy Spirit. Like starving people clamoring at heaven's throne for a river of God that flows all over us, all through us, all around us, 
that affects every part of our lives, even circumstances that are well beyond our personal control. It's true what Jesus said. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. That's the key to successful living. Blaise Pascal put it this way. There's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God, the creator made known through Jesus. God is spirit, and he's the only one who can satisfy our spiritual hunger. And the spiritual hunger of humanity is getting stronger and stronger. You can see it. You can hear it. I mean, people are pursuing all sorts of stuff. They're desperately pursuing things. And if you don't like what they're pursuing, they will cancel you. So we want to do our best to make it possible for you to not only have a hunger for God, but to make it possible to reach out. Our Connect Group leaders are going to do the same. But at the end of the day, it's up to you to decide whether you're going to hunger and thirst after the presence of the Holy Spirit by being intentional. Maybe you need to think about a couple of things or your daily time alone with God. You think, I need to bolster that a bit or I need to spend more time in the Word or more time just waiting on God. Or, I don't know what you need to do, but what I want you to do is to think about how you can be more determined this year to experience the presence of God. And I don't mean some, you know, yeah, moment. I mean Monday to Saturday moments. Sunday is just like the cherry on top where you get to go, woo! But where you're living in the power of the Holy Spirit, when you're at work, you're going, oh, wow! His presence is here and he's given me a great idea. So we want to see... You know, one of the things that we believe God wants for this church, and I think he wants it for churches across the world, to be Western world, to be honest, is that the way we used to do church and the way we used to build church was by having exceptional people doing exceptional things or having exceptional programs run by exceptional people. And so if you wanted to win the lost, you'd bring in an exceptional person like uh, Mark Ritchie, and he would do his thing, and then we'd all go, oh, praise the Lord, look, we've just had a whole bunch of people come to Jesus. Or we'd do this, that, and the other. But God is saying he wants the body to be the body. He wants you to be part of the adventure. He wants you to see miracles and see impossibilities happen and see what you never thought could be. He wants you to have a life that's full of joy and full of excitement and full of adventure and full of passion and full of possibilities and full of seeing what God can do with your life. So we believe in a church that is the whole church, the body of Christ. You know, you've heard me joke before, many, many churches, it's like going to a football match and you, you know, you've got thousands of people desperately needing exercise who are watching 22 guys who don't need any more exercise. What we want to be is not spectator. We live in a consumer world, so we tend to, if we're not thinking correctly, we'll come and be part of church life as a consumer. Bless me, speak to me, minister to me, 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 me. Sounds like a a little Japanese motorcycle that's running out of puff. But instead, we come and recognize how God sees it. I'm part of the body of Christ. I'm meant to be here. That's encouraging. I have things to contribute. Woohoo! And be a contributor, not just a consumer. So Hope Church requires your contribution. Hope Church, our church family, will not function if you don't play your part. It won't function as well as it could. You know, um, in our last church, Terry and I saw the church grow fantastically because there was a, we were doing exceptional things. We were bringing in exceptional people. We were having some exceptional programs. It was fantastic. But at the end of the day, one of the things that when God moved us from one country to another, was he, he basically was saying to us, I want you to reflect on this. I don't want the superstar on the pulpit thing anymore. I want my people to live their lives successfully in my name, with my power, with my might, with my principles, with my revelation. Amen? And that 
The church is the one who does the exceptional thing. Because the thing about the Holy Spirit is, ordinary people can do extraordinary things because they're not depending upon their own limitations. So before COVID, 80% of our church family were actively engaged in serving. And uh, that's taken a bit of a hit and up and down, and I'm not sure what the percentages are, but we want to get back to there if we're not there, and we want to be at least that. You know, in most churches, they expect between 5 and 20% of the people, 20% is considered good. We consider that life support situation, that's ICU. If your body was operating at 20%, you'd be in intensive care. We want to be at least 80%. And we make it 80% so that new people or struggling people or old people or whatever, people who have a good excuse are not feeling obligated or pressured. But if you're not one of those category, how can you contribute this year? You know, one of our Bethany, Bethany catering teams was out this Friday night, and I, I'm excited about that because they're making a difference for rough sleepers. Well done to them for serving God and for um, doing it through Hope Church as a family and for making a difference. So the second thing is to a prayer to change the atmosphere. In 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You know, I was encouraging people Friday night, Terry and I have seen what happens in communities where you have what's called a revival, a localised revival, where you believe God. And we've seen, you know, like an Aboriginal community in awful circumstances, uh, Stone Age nomadic people living on the edge of Western society, uh, and it, it was just chaos and pain, broken relationships, broken marriages, violence, uh, alcohol addiction and, and abuse beyond your... It was mind-boggling. And, and it was actually safer living in, in the front lines of a war zone than living on that community, according to the statistics. It was just an awful place. About 350 Aboriginal people, and uh, we were over 100 miles from the nearest town. The police never came out. And there was a church of less than 10 defeated Christians. And it was just tension and chaos. And we prayed for nine months and then saw God move. And in four nights, the church went from less than 10 to 300, who met every night. We couldn't stop the meeting. What do you do with a bunch of people who say, no, we're having, we're having a service tonight? And you better preach. <laughs> okay. So um, marriages were healed. Violent people became peaceful people. <laughs> Hallelujah, you've got no idea how good that was. I mean, when you've got a guy, you wake up in the middle of the night and there's a guy with an axe trying to break through the wall to put it, the axe through your head, it tends to get your blood flowing. And it's such a relief when he doesn't do that anymore. You think? So, you know, we've seen what God can do. And I believe that in the DNA of Scotland, here, let's talk about Scotland. The DNA of Scotland is the Word of God. The Word of God defines Scotland more than probably any other country on the planet. And it defines Western civilization. The Bible defines Western civilization. All the great principles that we take for granted, like freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion from state control, the rule of law, everyone being equal under the law, tolerance, compassion, fairness, that's, that comes from the Bible. Oh, that's not fair. Well, you, where would you get fairness from? I'll tell you where, because our culture is defined by the Bible. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. And so that's Western society. That's America. In the 19th century, the UK, and I know it's not all perfect history, but the UK became the most powerful nation on earth because at the time it was the most committed to the Bible. In the 20th century, the United States became the most powerful country in the world because it's the country that was the most committed to the Bible. Now we've got Russia and China standing back waiting for us to topple as a civilization because they see the rot well, what are we going to do? Well, I think we should get, unlock our DNA in Scotland again and have this as a land of hope and faith and peace and joy and the power of the Holy Ghost. Hello? Yeah. Well, you don't believe that? 
What would you prefer? You know, um, a lot of experts claim that Edinburgh is, uh, there's no city worse than Edinburgh spiritually in the world. Their cities is bad, but there's nowhere worse. They say that Scotland is the darkest nation in, in spiritually in the Western world. And I'm just not content to listen to that anymore. I'm going to pray and believe that this is going to become a nation known for its righteousness, yeah. known for its peace, known for its joy, known for its um, creativity, known for its confidence, known for its strength, known for its yeah. faith, known for its ability to change the world. Because uh, let me tell you something, this small nation has changed the world more than any other nation that we know of. That's our DNA. What are we going to do with it? Well, my vision is that we get back into that DNA. I'm sick of fiddling around with the rubbish that we see around us. And so I'm running out of time and I'm off my notes. So forgive me for a moment while I go, what am I supposed to be talking about? Terry approved my notes, by the way. This is the first time I can remember. I said to her, you better have a look at these because we're sharing about vision. I know we've talked about it and everything like that. but you better. So she checked them all and I had to adjust a few things and um, spell a few things a bit better. And, you know, that was all good. And now I've gone off track. But not really off track. It's the track that God is wanting us to hear and understand. And I think it's time to pray you know, uh, I've done, been doing some research on our, uh, what's happening around us. And what's happening around us in most of the communities that we represent is that drugs like marijuana and cocaine are ep at epidemic levels. And it's not just one area or a bad area here or there. Like in Musselburgh, it's everywhere. In Preston Pans, it's everywhere. In Trenent, it's everywhere. You name a place, it's everywhere. Um, and there's also major youth problems. You know, I talk to community leaders, major problems with youth. Um, and the drop-in centre is something that I'm believing that God will give us a chance to do something about as a, as a church. So what do we do? Well, you know, in our last church, we had a, a major problems with youth. And um, it became very violent. There was break-ins, there was vandalism. Uh, there was gangs that developed because they, they, they wanted to have fights, but how do you fight? So they just simply went, well, you're, you're black, you're white. We'll just make black and white gangs. And of course, everyone's like, oh, no, racism. It wasn't really racism. It was just like, how do we know who we're going to fight? I mean, it's crazy stuff. And um, the council brought in youth expert from um, New Zealand who was supposed to somehow transform this. And he just went, oh, man, this is awful. He's telling me. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, he was like a, he was definitely not a Christian in my view. He was like twitching with all sorts of weird stuff. And he said, we need a prayer meeting. And I went, sorry? And so we had the mayor, or provost as it's called here, and we had people and came to our, our, um, where we were meeting. We had a warehouse. We were meeting in a warehouse. And um, we had a big prayer meeting for the community, for all the youth problems. And then straight after that, the police used to gather in their break room, which was across the road from the entrance to the warehouse, and they would watch the gang members walking in black and white, arm in arm, laughing and bantering and joyful, and coming to, to worship God. And all the vandalism and the violence and the breaking and entering and everything, it just kind of disappeared. Let me tell you, it doesn't take many Christians to pray and believe for something to change and something to happen. And this year we want to be a people of prayer. So I'm encouraging you to get a hold of that. And um, so that we will have three more, two more times of three days prayer and fasting and really pressing into God together. I encourage you to, get, to, to jump in. Let's get on board. Let's care about our communities. Let's care about our neighbours. Let's care about what's happening in our society. You know... This is, these problems are not problems that governments can handle. Governments are very limited. They're trying to step way outside their God-given mandate and have been for years uh, because they, they can't see you know, how it's going to be, be done. But it's time for us to do it. And let's do it with prayer to start with. Is this making any sense to anyone? Let's believe God. And my last thing, and I'll try and be quick, is, is talk, you know, just working on the whole idea of, you know, we, we have a heart for the lost. 
we're all designed by God. We have the DNA to be disciple makers. So this year we want to explore a bit more to equip you so that you're better at doing that and uh, more confident in doing that and able to deal with the, 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 the things that hold you back from that, having a heart for the lost. But um, I've been doing some research and, and I've talked to some frontline evangelists and outreach people who are doing things like street cafes and, and, and different stuff. They're talking to Scots who are not in church. And what they're saying is they've never known Scots to be so open to talk about spiritual things but nobody's talking to them. And so I reckon this year, you and I should all decide we're going to change that. Does that make sense? And not people you have to be formally introduced and get to know them over six months before you can say, oh, by the way, I love Jesus. I mean, people you see at Costa. I love going to Costa with Anne-Marie. She, every single person she's, who's behind the counter who's female, I should say, female, She'll say, I love the way you've done your hair. And they all go, oh, you know, girls like that. I've discovered. And uh, I tell my wife, don't I? I say, your hair looks lovely. <laughs> Sorry? No idea what she's done to it, but it's a good thing to say. <laughs> it, it's like, <laughs> no, I, I do notice, believe me. The other thing, Ben, do you want a hint? Ben, do you want a hint? Always look at the shoes and say, I like your shoes. <laughs> Why is that? Well, if you've noticed the shoes, you've noticed the rest. There you go. That's a free bit of wisdom for you, boys. <laughs> Some of you are looking at me like, oh, for goodness sake. But those little things can make a difference. So. I want to ask you a question. If we're going to have a, this thing about heart for the lost and how we're going to be better at reaching people. Sorry? Vision, yeah. Well, your wife should be a vision to you. And you should encourage her with being a vision. So, <laughs> I grew up in a family where it was very combative verbally, so we always had a smart answer for things. Anyway... I'm getting off track. Can I ask you a question? If we're going to heart, have a heart for the lost, if we're going to actually care about people who are outside the kingdom, how many people do you pray for every day who are not followers of Jesus? How many people do you pray for every day who don't follow Jesus? Let me tell you something very simple. If everybody in this building right now who knows Jesus started a list of people that they were going to pray for every day, we're going to change our world. Did you hear what I said then? So what are you going to do about it? Our connect groups this year, we want to plant. Um, every connect group is going to plant one. We'll, we'll have this idea of each one bring one. Um, I've run out of time, so I'm, I'm, you're going to have to hear part two some other time. But... Um, I want to encourage you to think about this. If there's nothing else you walk away with today, it's I'm going to go home and start a list of people that I can pray for every day in my daily time alone with God, people that uh, I'm, I care about or people I've met or people I get to know. And you'll find that it'll start, you might start with two or three and you can, you'll can easily end up probably with 20 or 30 or even 40 or whatever people. It's amazing how once you start doing it and you just pray for them. And let me tell you this, God will answer. And so, um, I'm going to have to make this part two. We've run out of time. I was going to tell you all sorts of things about what we want to do with kitchens and halls and all sorts of practical things. So stay tuned. After Easter, you'll get part two. But right now, I want to encourage you. It says in Zechariah uh, 4.6, This is the word of the Lord. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So let's get a hunger for the Holy Spirit. Let's change the atmosphere of our communities through prayer. And let's um, be prepared to pray for the lost. Amen? Father, we come in Jesus' name and we look to you to seal these things to our hearts and cause us to get a hold of them.
better than we could otherwise get a hold of them. Seal them to our hearts. Move and motivate us, we pray. Lord, I pray that everyone here will be able to decide that they're going to achieve more than they thought they could by the end of the year. In Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that um, you'd help us all to be more desperate and more hungry for the presence and more prepared to be the body of Christ, to contribute to your kingdom purposes. In Jesus' name. While we're in prayer, can I just say, uh, there's always people on, uh, often watching on live stream, I know, and you've never said yes to Jesus. Today I want to encourage you to say yes to Jesus. Yes, I'm going to follow you. An awareness that God loves you, and I want to tell you that if you're not aware of it, God does love you. And our lives will never be fully complete unless Jesus is in our hearts. Unless we have that DNA of God implanted where it's meant to be. It's like a, the, miss, the missing jigsaw puzzle to our lives. And if you want to say yes to Jesus, you, you, you will recognize like I do that, you know, none of us is perfect. We've all fallen short of God's best. And that's why he sent his son to die in our place and to pay our penalty so that we have the opportunity to follow him and to become part of his family. And if that's you today, say yes to Jesus. If you're in the building here and maybe you're thinking, yes, I'd like someone to pray for me, then just raise your hand and say, yes, I've, I've decided I'm going to follow Jesus. Please pray for me. Just raise your hand where you are and say, yes, thank you very much. Put your hand down. Anyone else? There's somebody else here. I believe. I sense or something. Just say yes to Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your glory. 